Here we are at Northeast Creek. This is a wonderful wetland, good place to look for water birds, shore birds, and other birds that rely on, on wet edges. We're gonna walk out to the creek and see what we can find. Coming from the car, we walk along the shoreline. There's not really an established path, more of a social path. We work our way out the wetland, nice salt meadow, and eventually to Mount Desert Narrows out beyond those trees. As you can see, this is tidal here. We've got water rushing in and rushing out. Right now, tide's draining. And that grassy area is what we call salt pans. There'll be pools of, of shallow water surrounded by grass. And this is a good productive area for many kinds of shorebirds during the breeding season. Shorebirds, uh, Nelson sparrow, various herons and egrets, all will come through here either to feed or to breed. I mentioned salt pans. Pan is P-A-N-N-E-S, pans. And there's a salt pan just across the stream. It's a large area surrounded by this uh, grassy meadow and, um, and it's very shallow. And there's usually all kinds of little fish in there, killifish or uh, different different small fish and um, it's a favorite spot for some of the fish eating birds to gather especially the herons so often in another few weeks you'll see herons hanging out in there now we're looking out toward Mount Desert Narrows see it looks like tide has shifted and it's coming in I just talked to some fishermen they're out there actually worming and they said that the, the it's a little bit early in the season for the worms and the market's really drying up because of strictures on fishing in, in their coastal states where they're selling the worms as bait. But it's, uh, they're still doing it a little bit. And the worms are also important food for many fish, uh, for many birds. So here we are at the mouth of Northeast Creek. And I'm just panning, looking at the gulls. These are all herring gulls and ring-billed gulls. As the tide's coming in, they're working their way to higher ground. Make a quick count of the gulls there. So I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty. We'll call it thirty gulls. And it would actually be really interesting to count every individual one. Oh, and there's gonna be there's more flying in and flying past. maybe eight more gulls, three more. We've got 41 by my count. Gulls in the water. So it's a mix of herring gulls and ring-billed gulls. And after I'm done panning with the camera, I'll go back and count with my binoculars and try to get an idea of how many of each. The herring gull is a lot smaller. It's about three quarters the size, maybe even less than that. Maybe smaller. Um, than the, the than the herring gull. Herring gulls, of course, are larger. The herring gulls are what most people would consider the true seagull. Um, the seagull being that bird when people say, oh, I saw seagulls, often it's herring gulls. And the ring-billed gulls tend to breed on freshwater lakes, on islands, especially on freshwater. Herring gulls are much more ubiquitous, freshwater, saltwater. They'll breed either where, either place. The water we're looking at here, this is all Mount Desert Narrows, and we're looking at uh, Thomas Island there. And so this is all salt water. I'm hearing to my right, a red squirrel that's very angry about something. There, we've seen the opening up of Mount Desert Narrows there. Then heading over toward the Twinnies, two little islands where bald eagles nest.
and Mount Desert narrows once again. Got a herring gull. Looked like it had a mussel in its mouth. And I'm wondering if we'll see it fly up and do its thing of dropping the, the mussel on the rock to try to break it open. Of course, when you're a gull, the higher you fly, the further that mussel or clam will fall, the better chance of breaking open. But at the same time, the higher you fly, the longer it takes to get down to the land where you've dropped it, and better chance for another gull to swoop in and steal your food. Looks like he's not so interested in dropping it right now. So I just did a careful count of all the gulls that I could see in this field of view. Uh, not just in that little, little uh, rocky outcrop we're seeing there, but in the whole field of view that we previously scanned. And there's enough gulls, I didn't count every individual one, I ended up counting by tens. So what I do is I look at this little outcrop here and count, starting on the left, count ten gulls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, with that, extrapolate from there. So I think there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 70 to 75 gulls. I'm going to call it 70, just in that outcrop. And you can do that with bigger numbers too. You can count, you know, count by tens, then to hundreds, then start counting by hundreds. You can do it with then count by thousands, then by 10,000. So if you're at a black leg kittiwake, kittiwake uh, colony, where there might be two million birds, you want to be counting by tens of thousands of, of birds at a time. As you're watching the gulls, see if you can see the yellow bill with the black ring around near the tip. That's the ring-billed gull, and that'll be the smaller gulls. And then look for the gull with the yellow bill and the red spot, the gonidial spot, near the end of the bill, and that's the herring gull. That gull that was walking to the right now bent over, had something in his bill, that's a herring gull. The one facing left is also a herring gull. Large gulls. Not a lot of bird activity today here along Northeast Creek and Mount Desert Narrows. A lot of gulls, but other than that, not much activity. Heard a song sparrow, heard a Phoebe, heard a call note that sounded like my first palm warbler of the year. So we're gonna make our way back to Route 3 in the car and be done with our little field trip here. So thanks for coming along. Walking back to the car, I noticed that the gulls all flushed. There was probably 200 gulls up in the air and it was because a bald eagle flew over. By the time I got the camera set up on the tripod again and back out, the eagle had flown and the gulls had landed. Walking back along Northeast Creek, I heard a very loud, sharp, D, 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 which is the, kid, the kill deer. Sometimes they also say kiddy, kiddy. And so I quickly found that bird. This is a shorebird in the plover family. And kill deers are, um, they're a ground nester. They're one of just a few small handful of birds, of shorebirds that nest in Maine. And this shorebird will nest usually in a grassy area. Sometimes I'll see them at Thompson Island, or if you had a gravel area, a large gravel parking lot, you might find them nesting in the gravel. And they'll make a nest in the grass. They'll lay their eggs. Usually the female will stay on the eggs. And then the male will kind of uh, patrol the area, feed, feed the female. And when a predator comes too close, he'll kind of sneak off, then make a loud noise to draw the attention of the predator. Then he'll drag a wing, pretending to have a broken wing, and then run away with the predator hopefully following them away from the nest. And once he feels like he's got the predator sufficiently far away, miraculously his wing heals, and he'll fly off unseen. Thanks for joining the Natural History Center on our virtual birding tour. Look for more of our tours in the coming weeks.